Hello, welcome back to another episode of the Core Consult RX podcast. Cole, what's going on, man? Not too much. Good to be back in the studio. Of course, absolutely. We've had a hard time uh, getting our schedules on, uh, you on know, point. Summertime. Mm-hmm. It's pretty, yeah, we're almost into fall now. I, I was going to say, I'm pretty sure. Sh- when does summer end? Oh, I feel I don't like know. it's got to be fall now, right? You think? It's October? I don't know. I suppose. It doesn't matter. But anyway. I always think of Halloween, but it's got to be before that. Yeah, maybe. You think we- <laughs> Anyways, that doesn't matter. <laughs> we've had a hard time getting our schedules rather. So we've had a lot of sporadic release dates, but uh, we're trying to, trying to get things back on track. Yes. Tonight is a, an accredited episode. Thanks to our friends at FreeCE.com, and we're going to be discussing BPH and OAB, so mm-hmm. overactive bladder, um, and we'll talk about them kind of in their own, you know, separate ways, but then also how BPH can sometimes be complicated by overactive bladder symptoms, and, um, you know, some options we have there to add, as ag- adjunct therapy and, and whatnot, so... We'll get into some of that, um, but like I said, it's this episode's accredited, so for those of you who have a unlimited membership with FreeCE.com, uh, all of our accredited episodes are available to you, and we will give you a password uh, at some point during this episode, and you'll um, use that to activate the, uh, or get access to, rather, um, the post-activity test, and uh, once you pass that, you'll get your one hour of continuing education credit, if, uh, if it's available for pharmacists and nurses. So uh, make sure you take advantage of that. And if you're not a free CE member, like we've said many times on the show before, I definitely encourage you to check out their library of content, and they have a lot of good learning opportunities. So thanks to them for continuing to partner with us. Yes. All, All right. right. BPH. Let's start off with that, I guess. Yeah, let's start with BPH, which we haven't said stands for benign prostatic hyperplasia, also called benign prostatic enlargement, BPE, but I feel like BPH is is a little more common. Um so the prostate, we can talk a little bit about that. It's a small heart-shaped um, chestnut-sized gland, so not very big, uh, located below the urinary bladder. And it does have a function, has a couple of major functions. Um, it secretes fluids that make up a portion of the ejaculate volume, about 20 to 40%. It also provides secretions with antibacterial effect, uh, possibly related to its high concentration of zinc. Uh, but as individuals age, of course, it... Uh, can enlarge. Yes. So the the prostate gland itself is made up of three types of tissue. We have epithelial tissue, um, which is going to produce the prostatic secretions um, that are delivered into the urethra during ejaculation. Um, Also, androgens themselves will stimulate epithelial tissue growth. Um, Stromal tissue is another um, type of tissue that's found in the prostate gland, and it's um, what contains those alpha androgenic receptors that can cause smooth muscle contraction when stimulated by norepinephrine, and the same goes for the capsule um, as well. It's the third type of tissue, and um, you'll notice when we get into some of the the uh, medications that we utilize for BPH, uh, a alpha-1 androgenic receptor is a big target that we go after. Um, so the, the normal prostate is composed of a higher amount of stromal tissue um, than epithelial tissue, and it's usually like a two-to-one ratio, but in patients that have BPH, it can actually be like a, as high as five-to-one ratio, and um, so that stromal tissue tends to get out of control with, with uh, proliferation, if you will. Um, the prostate's dependent on androgens, uh, primarily testosterone, for the development and maintenance of size and function. In a normal prostate gland, is generally, um, in an adult man, weighs about 15 to 20 grams. Have I told you the story about when we went on a um, medical mission trip to South Africa and uh, the the interaction with a prostate? I can't remember if I told this on the I don't think so, on the but podcast. I am all ears. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, anyways, we were on a medical mission trip to South Africa, and we were kind of running a, a free clinic, and it was hugely popular, hundreds and hundreds of people. Anyways, um, it was primarily run by physician assistants, and there were a whole, a whole host of physician assistant students. And um, uh, this one fellow comes in, and um, he's having symptoms of BPH, so the physician assistant um, you know, checks his prostate. And uh, it was um, uh, markedly enlarged, I suppose, and apparently a good 
um, uh, teaching opportunity. So he asked, the, he asked the guy, he's like, hey, we got a bunch of students here. Is it okay if they feel your prostate? Because this is a good example of what an enlarged prostate uh, feels like. He's like, sure, come on, come on. <clears throat> Literally a line of physician assistant students just <laughs> back to this back. poor guy. Feeling the guy's prostate. Interesting. <laughs> Not hilarious. Yeah. He was that, totally cool. Yeah, well, get a give back to science. I, I guess, guess so. <laughs> Well, Anyways. Good, good for him. Um, I would be like, can we have? Can we maybe limit it to one? Right. <laughs> Possibly <laughs> one student. Maybe one student uh, instead uh, of like an army of students. Please, of the of the not a female and, and yeah, yeah, the whole thing. Right. Um, yes. So this guy's was not a normal size uh, prostate, which, like I said, weighs fifteen to twenty grams. Testosterone is metabolized to dihydrotestosterone by five alpha reductase or andro- or estrogen by aromatase enzymes. And then dihydrotestosterone is responsible for the normal um, and hyperplastic growth. Now, BPH can arise from both static and dynamic factors. So when we say static factors, we're talking about those that are related to the actual anatomical enlargement um, you know, of the prostate gland itself. So this is going to actually produce like a physical block at, at the bladder neck and obviously obstruct urinary outflow. Um, enlargement of the gland depends, obviously, like Cole said, on the androgen stimulation of the epithelial tissue, um, as well as estrogen stimulation on stromal tissue in the prostate. Um, and so, you know, the, the enlargement itself is what we think of as like the static factor. Dynamic factors relate to the excessive um, alpha androgenic tone of the stromal component of the prostate gland, the bladder neck, the posterior urethra. And, you know, this is going to result in contraction of the prostate gland around the urethra, as well as the narrowing of the urethral lumen. Um, as far as BPH, which we know to be a pretty common um, condition. Uh, as far as age, peak incidence of clinical BPH occurs between ages 63 to 65 years old. Um, the Boston area normative aging study, so one study um, estimated that the cumulative incidence of clinical BPH was 70 78% for patients over the age of 80. Um, so incidence is going to increase over time. Uh, there was another study called the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, and they, they projected that about 60% of men at least 60 years old develop clinical uh, BPH. There's also some you know, risk factors that we want to try to avoid. And I shouldn't say risk factors, but more like uh, – things that can can exacerbate symptoms. Um, medications, uh, there's several that we would want to ideally avoid um, patients that have a established history of BPH. Um, for one, testosterone replacement regimens are a big one because if we're adding more testosterone to the patient's regimen, then we're obviously going to add to the potential for that prostate gland growth. Um, so ideally, pro, uh, testosterone replacement therapy would not be utilized in, uh, in patients with BPH. Again, ideally, there's definitely workarounds for that and things that, um, it, you know, that patients can be on TRT, if, you know, in certain situations if for quality of life purposes and whatnot. But uh, the textbook ideal answer would be no TRT. Um, also, oral decongestants, so pseudofedrin. Uh, basically, we're worried there about with the stimulation of those alpha androgenic receptors in the prostate and you know, obviously worsening the urinary retention. And then any kind of an anticholinergic drug. So obviously antihistamines and then, you know, are things that we don't always think about like our and certain antidepressants like our tricyclics and, um, you know, other medications that we, you know, have to worry about anticholinergic. It's it really, we're, in this case, we're obviously worried about the urinary retention um, as well as the, the other anticholinergic effects can worsen quality of life as well. But the big one is that urinary retention. Right. Right. Um, and there's essentially two categories of symptoms that BPH can be divided into. There's obstructive symptoms and irritative uh, voiding, sim- voiding symptoms, symptoms that happen while they're voiding. Um, the obstructive symptoms tend to be more, uh, I don't know, people tend to complain a little more about those. They result when dynamic and um, static factors reduce bladder emptying. Um, so the urinary flow rate decreases um, and bladder emptying is incomplete. Uh, and then the voiding symptoms result from long-standing obstruction of the bladder neck. Um, the detrusor muscle um, cholinergic receptors become super sensitive to small volumes of urine in the bladder, and there's involuntary bladder contractions that are triggered, resulting in urinary urgency and frequency. And I'm sorry, I think I meant to say that the voiding symptoms with the urinary urgency and frequency tends, tends to be a little more bothersome, but yeah. 
Well, and, you know, when we talk about obstructive and irritative voiding symptoms and their overall negative impact on a patient's quality of life, we typically refer to that, you know, concept as lower urinary tract symptoms or LUTs, as it's LUTs. abbreviated. And the American Urological Association um, uses something they call the uh, symptom index score, and that can also kind of help to determine the severity of the patient's uh, symptoms. So obviously establishing that they do have you know, LUTs uh, in the first place, and then also we can kind of put you know that severity behind it to see how quickly we need to escalate therapy or which direction you know we need to go if we even need to start therapy. So the, the index itself is going to consist of seven questions that are all evaluating the severity of, of LUTs on a scale of zero to five. Higher numbers obviously indicate more severe symptoms and, you know, a need for potentially more intensive therapy. And uh, patients can complete a avoiding diary in which, you know, they record the number of voids, the volume of each void, and voiding symptoms for several days. If you want to get really thorough and, and I would dare I say fancy with uh, your workup of the patient, um, I, my real world, uh, alarms going off saying I doubt a patient uh, unless you have a very you know just very involved patient that takes their their health very seriously and wants to be actively involved I feel like it would be very difficult to keep a a very thorough voiding diary for a lot of patients but that's just yeah, you know, my experience. The volume of each void. I mean, you have to measure you, it. You come the the kit comes with a an Earl Miller flask and you have to oh, no. <laughs> yeah yeah that's not true. I was about to say, that sounds you're like You up. looked at me like, is this a real thing? Well, I'd imagine if you're going to record the volume, there does need to be some sort of measuring device. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's there, man, you know, some sort of container. Business opportunity. <laughs> we, <laughs> we sell uh, LUTs kits. I bet you could. Voiding diary. I bet you could 3D print those uh, oh, containers. Oh, for sure. Uh, you ever watch The Addams Family? Mm -mm. Never mind. Okay. Well, there's a large person, like a kind of like a Frankenstein looking guy. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen that. Uh, is his I've, name Lutz? I have no idea. Lurch. Lurch. Never mind. His name is Lurch. Close. That's what I thought every time you said Lutz. That guy was coming to my mind. Ah. But his name Big is Adam's Family fan? I mean, I watched it. Okay, right on. Yeah. Wasn't that, there a new one recently? The new Netflix thing. Oh, yeah. Um, was it good? I didn't see it. What was it called? I don't know. I didn't see it either. Adam's but, Family? I mean, it was all over the was place. Was it called The Adam's Family? No. no Reboot? No, no. It was about, um, it was just about the uh, the girl. It'll come to me oh. at some point. Wendy. Isn't that her name? Or Wednesday or something? Wednesday. I can't remember what the show was called. Wednesday though. seems like it should be your name, but I feel like it's probably Wednesday. No, it's Wednesday. Adams. It is? Okay. Um, okay. I'll look it up later. Yeah. Anyways. Anyways. Back, sorry, guys. Back to BPH. <laughs> back to the um, back to the severity index. Yeah. So uh, it, it stratifies it into mild, moderate, or severe. Mike mentioned some of the scoring. Um, the mild is less than 7. Moderate is 8 to 19. Severe is greater than 20. Um, uh, if you score in the mild category, you might be asymptomatic. You might have a peak urinary flow rate less than 10 milliliters per second. Um, and then uh, you might have a post-void residual urine volume of greater than 25 to 50 milliliters. Um, moderate would be all those same symptoms plus obstructive voiding symptoms and irritative voiding, voiding symptoms. Um, so there's signs of detrusor instability. And then severe would be all those things plus one or more complications of BPH as well. Now, like Cole mentioned earlier, you know, there's one way of uh, simply, a, you know, a very simple assessment of how um, potentially enlarged a patient's prostate may be. And uh, this is known as the digital rectal exam, DRE. And so uh, it's very simple, but I'll let you look that up if for educational purposes if you're interested. Um, it's a, one of those exams that makes me happy to be a pharmacist and uh, not a PA. But um, the uh, urinalysis should also be done as well uh, because we obviously want to screen for any kind of um, metaurea or any signs of um, you know, renal stones or any signs of infection. And um, there are certain criteria a patient may meet that would indicate they would be uh, a candidate for a serum prostate-specific antigen or PSA, um, which is obviously there to, to screen for prostate cancer. And so this is something that can be done in patients um, over the age of 40 or more. Patients should also have a 10-year life expectancy, and obviously the potential benefit of diagnosing prostate cancer is outweighed by the cost of the test itself. And so if, if the patient you know, is, has never had one and it meets that criteria, it would be a good idea to get a PSA as well. Um, guess what the show's called? What's it called? Wednesday. I'm so... I'm, didn't I say that? You I'm did. pretty sure I nailed it. You did. We said her name was Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm like a bigger fan than you are. I guess so. <laughs> I think I did watch the first episode now that I see the... 
the picture. Anyways. Um, it's the most we've ever talked about Adam's family. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Objective measures of bladder emptying um, would include peak and average urinary flow rate, which you might think, how do they determine what the peak and average urinary flow rate is? Well, they have something called a Euroflow meter, um, and I guess the practice of this is called Euroflowmetry. Fl- Euroflowmetry. Flometry. Euroflowmetry. Yeah. Um, and if you can imagine, um, you know when you're adding oil into your car, mm-hmm. got the. Uh, I've seen people funnel. do that through the window as, <laughs> I, wa- as I watch the real men out there. As you hand them their seventy dollars, right? And, and I, and I stare at them and go, yeah. "Wow, that must be cool to know how to work on cars." <laughs> but you have the funnel. Just imagine yeah. a funnel going into a pitcher, and then some sort of thing that's measuring how much is going in at what rate, and you pee into one of those, and bada bang, bada boom. That's a euro flow meter. Um, Post void residual urine volume is assessed using an abdominal. Um, ultrasound, abdominal ultrasonography. Um, so a uh, uh, post-void residual volume of urine, 25 to 50 milliliters or more, implies failure of the uh, bladder emptying and a predisposition for urinary tract infections. So you're not getting all of the urine out of the bladder. Yeah. And, you know, that's, I feel like that's where the, the patients typically, the way they actually, you know, express their symptoms, they usually say it's just very hard to empty my bladder all the way. I feel like I finished going to the bathroom, but then I feel like I could still go some more, but nothing's coming out. And it, obviously it, it's one of those things that can be very just – it's it's not a a typical like disease state that we think of like it's not you know chronic pain or certain things but it can very much so affect quality of life affects patients ability to travel induces anxiety social issues um you know it's definitely a, a, a big burden on quality of life so we want to make sure that we can mitigate the symptoms as best as we can i mean i'm sure it's uncomfortable if i have like you know a little teeny rock in my shoe i think i can't think about it all day you know so imagine having <laughs> The feeling of, you know, not you, emptying your bl- yeah, bladder fully. For sure. Be very frustrating. All right. So I guess we'll, let's start off with uh, mild disease because like Cole said, a lot of these patients can be asymptomatic when they're seen. So, you know, patients, you know, may have some very mild bothersome symptoms, but a lot of times they're asymptomatic and they're not at risk for like complications of, of BPH necessarily. So this is the patient that could be a candidate for watchful waiting. So we're not necessarily starting medications at this point, kind of seeing how they do and, you know, going from there and waiting until their symptoms get a little worse before we do start medication. This is obviously needs to be patient specific or if you're really concerned about side effects based on their comorbidities or something. But um, I, I would say, yeah, at least me anyway, I'd be hard pressed to have a patient that's the symptoms are at least bothersome enough to them to seek treatment and then me going, well, just going to watch and wait and see how much worse it gets for you. Um, but no, obviously, if we're trying to avoid medications, watchful waiting can be an option. Um, we would definitely want the patients to return you know, and get reassessed every 6 to 12 months or sooner if their symptoms change. But um, the watchful waiting is not just kind of as I facetiously was alluding to, just, you know, okay, see you later, kick them out the door. It does need to be accompanied by patient education, ideally. And so talking to them about restricting fluids, especially close to bedtime, um, minimizing caffeine, minimizing alcohol intake, uh, frequent emptying of the bladder when the patient is awake, and especially if they're planning on certain long trips or anything, and then avoiding drugs like we talked about in the beginning that can exacerbate voiding symptoms or cause urinary retention and make the symptoms worse. I guess it could be a situation where someone comes in with mild disease and they're like, hey, doc, I'm having these symptoms. Like, what can you do? And he's like, well, we got these meds. And they're like, ooh, I don't really want to take meds. Well, you have mild disease, so we can mm-hmm. comfortably watch and wait and reassess. And they're like, okay, sounds good. That's a great. That's exactly how it would go, probably. Thank you. Yeah, Thank good you. job, Cole. Maybe I should just be a doctor. Dude, honestly, <laughs> you def- you pretty much are in my I'll eyes. I'll start tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, just start tomorrow. Guys, I'm here to see patients. You guys, <laughs> you're wearing the stethoscope. Yeah. I got my, my doctor, t-shirt on. My doctor <laughs> scope. Yeah, my, my, my doctor stuff. Um, okay, well, we'll talk about meds, which would be uh, what you would do if you cannot watchfully wait. Uh, I'll start with alpha adrenergic blockers, uh, which are generally considered first line treatment um, these days for patients with moderate to severe symptoms. They inhibit alpha one adrenergic receptors and relax smooth muscles in the prostate and the bladder neck. Um, so they're going to enhance urinary outflow from the bladder, assist you know with a weak stream and and um, incomplete emptying of the bladder, that sort of thing. Uh, There's three types of alpha receptors. There's one A, which are located primarily in the bladder neck and the prostate. But there's also 1B and 1C that they would um, 
potentially fine with as well. Yeah. Potentially fine with as well. Well, and that's a it's kind of a good segue into non-selective versus selective beta block or excuse me alpha blockers. Be, our old school drugs like our um, terazosin, prazosin, are are non-selective alpha blockers to where you know they're obviously going to. Uh, affect the bladder and neck and relieve some of that, but they're also going to have an effect on peripheral vascular receptors. Um, and, you know, that's oftentimes where you get this orthostasis is, a, you know, a big side effect that we worry about with, with alpha blockers. And you know, if the patient is going to be put on one of the old school alpha blockers, the non-selectives, then giving it at bedtime is usually a way to kind of minimize some of that orthostasis, especially the initial like first dose, um, it, like the first dose phenomenon where it can cause really severe orthostasis. And um, definitely Definitely having them take it at night can mitigate some of that risk. And then also if a patient has nocturia where they're having to get up multiple times, you know, the, the concern there becomes the fall risk. A lot of these patients are elderly, and so we don't want to cause orthostasis as the patient's getting out of bed and cause them to have a fall and a whole new slew of problems. Um, and then also the alpha blockers, as we know, can lower blood pressure. That's one of the, you know, their indications that even though we, we hate those as far as antihypertensive options, um, they will lower blood pressure. And so if a patient's on other antihypertensives, these are going to affect that, you know, as well and potentially cause some hi- uh, hypotension. Right. And we want to improve tolerance to the adverse effects. And so best way to do that is start low, titrate slowly up to a full dose over several weeks. Uh, there's also an extended release doxazosin, which is Cardura XL, might be a better option than the immediate release formulations, once daily dosing, um, treatment initiation with a full therapeutic dose, you don't have to titrate the same way, um, and it, there's decreased dose-related hypotension. Um, with the Cardura XL, have you seen the the ghost how, it, how it's a, in a ghost tablet? It's how it's no. that's how it's you know extended release. It uses that I can't remember what they call it, but that like osmotic release where it's like a pin you know size hole in the middle of the tablet oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had a patient not too long ago call me because their body just does not absorb Cardura and uh, I'm like okay well why do you say that well you know when when I uh, you know, have a bowel movement I noticed that the Cardura is in my stool I was like, ah, yes, <laughs> it's so it's a ghost tablet the, the tablet itself is there because that's that was the shield from the you know gastric lining or the gastric contents and all that but the medication is removed through that pore in the center and it's absorbed in the small intestine and the, the shell the, or the ghost tablet is left over yeah i can see where that could be disconcerting yeah also why why are you exam- checking it out? examining so closely <laughs> so closely right i mean everybody takes a glance i mean sure but like who doesn't take a glance and then to make unless a, you're and a then cur- follow it up with a phone call it's just a weird series of <laughs> unless you're a courtesy flusher yeah you know mm, what I'm saying? that's true then you might not never see Anyways, sorry, um, I didn't mean to cut you off with that. Important to note that um, both the urological association guidelines and the hypertension guidelines recommend that patients with BPH and hypertension, so if they have both, be treated separately with appropriate treatment options for each medical condition based on the current guidelines, i.e., don't just use the alpha adrenergic blockers because you feel like you're killing two birds because they're not great for hypertension. Yeah, and they, we saw with uh, that all had trial in hypertension that do- the doxazosin arm was actually cut off early because it was had an increased risk of heart failure. Yep. So yeah, definitely not good to use the non-selectives just for that purpose. Yep. Um, now we do have selective alpha blocker options. Uh, there's three of them. The most common, at least in my experience, would be the tamsulosin. Um, there's also aflazosin and psilocin. Uh, they're a little bit different administrative um, directions with them. So the tamsulosin ideally is taken 30 minutes after the same meal each day, whereas the aflazosin is immediately after the same meal, and um, the rapid flow is just daily with the meal. It's not even they get less specific as they go. Um, these agents are uroselective, so they're going to be focusing on the alpha one A receptor specifically. So they're going to have a much less risk of hypotension. Um, however, they are more likely to cause certain um, sexual dysfunction, especially when it comes to ejaculatory disorders, uh, because they are focused on that alpha-1 receptor. Uh, they do have some contraindications, specifically with psilocin and aflazosin in patients with hepatic impairment. So, you know, if you have a patient with cirrhosis or they have, you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you know, something along those lines that uh, you would probably want to use well, um, tamsulosin instead of those two. And then uh, psilocin is also contraindicated if the patient's creatinine clearance is less than 30 mils per minute. 
And when compared to, with placebos, the selective alpha blockers have been shown to lower the um, severity index score by four to six points in patients with BPH and ex- who are experiencing LUTs. Yeah. Um, Psilocin Rapiflo, which is the newer one, um, does have greater uroselectivity than tamsulosin, which I think is supposed to be a positive thing, though there's not really a significant difference in how well they work. But there is a higher incidence of ejaculatory disorders with psilocin because of the um, higher selectivity. Sometimes you'll see tamsulosin increase to 0.8 milligrams, um, normally 0.4. Um, that is going to increase adverse effects and has an inconsistent improvement in effectiveness. So just be aware of that. Um, the, all these agents, the selective ones, are well tolerated in patients with well-controlled hypertension, um, but patients with a sulfa allergy should avoid tamsulosin. Have you ever had a patient who mentioned having like back pain with tamsulosin specifically? I don't think so. So the, 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 this happened to me twice now, so I'll mention it on here. I've had a one patient, this was a couple of years ago, that was convinced he had renal stones. I mean, I mean, he had gone as far as getting like ultrasounds and I mean, he'd been to the hospital a couple of times for it. And, you know, he had been on tamsulosin for, I don't know, four to six months or so and his urinary problems had gotten better but the back he was convinced he had kidney stones even though they couldn't find anything mm-hmm. there's no history of kidney stones and um it was one of those things i did some research and looked into it a little bit and tamsulosin does have that listed as a potential side effect and so i, I just was like well you know that's maybe i i can't imagine that's what's causing it but let's give it a shot and move them over to um Aflazosin, I believe. And within like four days, he's like, dude, my back pain's gone. It just, it's reported as lower back pain. Yeah. Huh. And uh, the thought process, at least um, according to the uh, chat, you know, GPT or whatever, um, who did some uh, did some good research on studies briefly before we started, um, <laughs> it, uh, it was basically saying that the, it, the smooth muscle contraction can relax some of the muscles around that. Yeah, you know, around you know the bladder, neck, and all that, and including the like the lower back, and it's not consistent when it gets further out from the bladder. So the thought is that maybe you're developing almost like a, um, all, like a you know, imbalance in the muscle. I, I guess the way they support movement and stuff. I don't know. Huh. It said that it's it's like a theory. They don't know for Tell sure. Me you asked Chat GPT that, and he came up with an answer. Mm-hmm. Oh, not only that, but he came up with like four other potential options too. Jeff, Jeff, the very well versed in evidence. You must medicine. Pay, you must pay for premium. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> I'm not trying to look up a bunch of studies. <laughs> no, um, but it, and then literally four weeks ago, I had another patient who was was planning surgery on his back, stopped tamsulosis, and I said, "This is." gonna like way out on a limb it's probably not gonna do anything to help but let's try it for a week his back pain got so much better that he canceled the surgery really <laughs> yeah oh my gosh i don't know if that's just a massive placebo effect or what but i i read the um surgeon's note that you know was put in there yeah followed up he said his back back is 80 percent better because he did have some lower back injury but he right. said it was like 80 percent better he goes um apparently his farm he told him it could be from the tantalus and he's he's Said stopped it and that's what worked. He goes, stranger things have happened. Like, okay, dude, don't be throwing shade, shade in your note towards me. How dare you? I don't know what this pharmacist told him, but yeah, whatever. Whatever, dude. Whatever, man. It's <laughs> um, great. But uh, yeah, so the other kind of a rare side effect, I guess you'd say, was something to at least be aware of is intraoperative floppy iris syndrome. Um, this is more so associated with doxazosin, psilocin, and tamsulosin, and with tamsulosin being the most common uh, risk of it. And it's basically, you know, we've worried about this in men who have LUTs that are being offered an alpha blocker um, who have a planned cataract surgery already on the books. Um, because the, the blockade in the alpha-1 androgenic receptors uh, can affect the iris uh, deletory muscles, this can lead to complications, and it, it complicates the procedure overall. And um, that uh, intraoperative, you know, or postoperative, rather, a complication risk goes up so much that, you know, they need to take specific precautions and things ahead of time. So if the patient is, you know, planning on starting an alpha blocker, already has a, the cataract surgery scheduled, just do that first and then start them on the alpha blocker after. If they're already established on the alpha blocker and then they later on need um, surgery, then just you know let the ophthalmologist know and, and they can make proper you know adjustments if they need to. Um, and then besides the intraoperative floppy iris syndrome, some other 
kind of random things that can occur is priaprism. Uh, and then also angina is another potential and, and more so with the non-selective alpha blockers. The thought process basically being that the you block the alpha receptors, that means you have unopposed beta activity, which speeds up the heart rate, speeds up oxygen demand, and if you don't have as much oxygen, then you're going to get some angina. Hmm. So um, things to watch out for. Um, apart from that, you can also have some more common adverse effects, dizziness, fatigue, headache, fluid retention, abnormal ejaculation, like we mentioned, specifically with tamsulosin and psilocin, or at least primarily. Um, alpha blockers don't shrink the prostate. Uh, it's good to note, and they don't change PSA levels. Um, they work right away, but four to six weeks may be required to assess whether they're getting the full benefit, whether that's been achieved. Um, with the patients who are at risk for a prolonged QT, uh, you don't want to use alfizosin. And um, sometimes these can be used off-label for bladder outlet obstruction in women. Yeah, I've seen... Uh Back when I was doing uh, retail pharmacy, I saw some prescriptions come through for like a five-day supply of Tamsulosin when they were having a kidney stone pass or something. Yep. And uh, if the system's going nuts, yeah, it's like, don't do it. It's like Tamsulosin and Norco. It's a, it's a trap. <laughs> Tamsulosin and Hydrocodone. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Kidney stone. Kidney stone. I've never had a kidney stone. They don't look fun. No. So the other thing to keep in mind with alpha blockers because oftentimes these patients will have issues with erectile dysfunction, and as we'll talk about in a little bit, there is a medication that can treat erectile dysfunction that can also be used at a lower dose daily for BPH symptoms. Um, so that would be the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. If you use that along with a alpha blocker, it obviously can add to that hypotensive risk. And it's not to say that patients cannot be on the combo. There are patients that do okay on you know both medications at, the, at once. It would be ideal to obviously in that situation use a selective alpha blocker. It's going to be ideal to do that regardless, but hopefully the patient's on a selective alpha blocker and then make sure the patient's stable, their blood pressure is not you know dropping on the, they're not having any orthostasis before starting the to you know the uh, PDE five inhibitor. And, Spoiler alert, it's going to be Tadalafil. <laughs> but, uh, you know, making sure that the patient can tolerate it and then going slow. Or I've, I, one thing I did not too long ago was a patient who was on two capsules of Tamsulosin, the 0.8, didn't see too much improvement when they went up, so I dropped the dose back down before adding the, the Tadalafil. Um, but uh, the other thing, keep in mind um, that the alpha blockers are three, four substrates. So you got to worry about drug, drug interactions. And then, um, psilocin also is a substrate of P glycoprotein. And so watching out for strong, um, P glycoprotein inhibitors like cyclosporin, um, is important as well. Yeah. So before we go further, throw the password out before we both forget. Let's do it. So, um, today's password is going to be B Y E LUTS by LUTS. L-U-T-S. Yes, L-U-T-S, all capital letters, no space, B-Y-E-L-U-T-S. And you'll have full access to our super fun activity, <laughs> post-activity test. You're going to do great. Good luck. Lots of confidence, lots of energy, we'll lots of positivity. Yeah, S sending good vibes your way. Yeah, Could you imagine? First try, 60. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, probably more of a reflection on us than right. that, right? No, for sure. Um, okay, so let's talk about a different medication class, the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors that are indicated for management of moderate to severe BPH um, when the patient's prostate glands are at least 40 grams. Those are finasteride and dutasteride. No doubt you've seen them. Finasteride also used in um, hair loss as well. Uh, but they prevent the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, and they are approved to modify the disease course. Um, they may reduce the risk of urinary retention and surgical interventions um, in the studies. They can cause sexual dysfunction, impotence, Im impotence decreased libido, um, and ejaculation disturbances. Other common adverse effects are you know, nausea, abdominal pain, um, asthenia, dizziness, flatulence, headache, um, also gynecomastia of note. One of the clinical questions that will come up is, you know, do these medications, we know that they strengthen the prostate and, and control the, the you know, growth of it, obviously, going forward, but uh, is it going to reduce the risk of prostate 
cancer. Um, so one study, the prostate cancer prevention trial, um, looked at patients that had an enlarged prostate and a PSA level um, that was less than three nanograms per liter. Um, they were prescribed finasteride five milligrams daily and followed for up to seven years. So finasteride at the seven-year mark reduced the um, prevalence of prostate cancer by 25%. But, of note, um, finasteride was associated with a 27% increase in the number of patients who developed high-grade prostate cancer. And, you know, the higher incidence of prostate cancer was, they thought to be due to um, biopsy sampling bias, but, you know, nonetheless, it's still something to at least take a some pause maybe. Um, and then there was also the reduced trial, which um, was four years of continuous use of dutasteride versus placebo. And the dutasteride uh, treated patients had a 22.8% decrease relative risk of prostate cancer. And there was no statistical difference between groups and the occurrence of high grade prostate cancer. So, you know, they, they, some people have justified that to say that dutasteride may be a better option than finasteride, but cost also is a factor as well because dutasteride can be a little bit more pricey. Um, good to note that pregnant women should not take or handle um, five alpha reductase inhibitors because they can be absorbed through the skin and cause birth defects. Finasteride competitively inhibits type two five alpha reductase and lowers prostatic dihydrotestosterone by eighty to ninety percent. Um, dutasteride is non-selective. Um, and it inhibits both type 1 and type 2, 5-alpha reductase. Um, prostatic dihydrotestosterone production is quickly suppressed, and um, even though there's some differences with what they're inhibiting, there's not really a difference between how well each of them work. I feel like I see finasteride a little more commonly, mm -hmm. but dutasteride as well. Yeah. Um, they don't immediately reduce lower urinary tract symptoms, um, and like we said, they should be reserved for men with a large prostate volume greater than 40 grams. Um, so usually they need at least six months um, to achieve clinical benefits, so a little different than the, ones we, the other ones we talked about. Um, but they can reduce prostate size, which is a little more unique, uh, by about 25% during that six-month period. Now, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors can also um, reduce serum PSA levels by as much as 50% um, in the first 6 to 12 months when they start therapy. Now, obviously, we would want to obtain a PSA level at baseline if the patient's a candidate for getting a PSA level, and then kind of repeating that PSA after six months of treatment and comparing the pretreatment PSA. Uh, if the new PSA level does not decline by 50%, um, you know, the patient should be evaluated for prostate cancer. Uh, and, and if the patient, you know, has, says they've been taking it, obviously you want to double check and, and, and evaluate their adherence to make sure that that's not part of the, the problem if they're not taking the medication. Um, and then patients with an increase in PSA level of 0 0.3 or more above the baseline should be evaluated for prostate cancer as well. Yep. Um, so there are instances where we need combination therapy um, when uh, a man is having lower urinary tract symptoms, they have a larger prostate, and they have an elevated PSA. Um, finasteride with doxazosin is the most well-studied. Um, dutasteride is FDA-approved for use with tamsulosin in um, symptomatic men having an enlarged prostate. Um, there is a branded combination to test right in tam solution uh, it's called Jalen. um that's a dumb name it's a silly name yeah it? i don't like it it's okay though though usually that. we complain about um brand names being too on the nose that's true that it is easy to pronounce completely unrelated to everything else um it's probably pronounced Yalen or something we're saying it wrong uh there was one trial um looking at the combination of um avodart and tam -Solosin. Um, the combat trial, it evaluated monotherapy versus combination therapy, and it found that um, in these particular patients, um, you can achieve further benefit with the two drugs in combination. So, yeah, yeah. dutasteride, tamsulosin. All right. So we have a third class of medication we kind of alluded to earlier, the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, uh, and the one that's approved for BPH is Tadalafil or Cialis, 5 milligrams, taken daily as opposed to as needed, like it is typically used for uh, erectile dysfunction. Um, they also studied 2.5 milligrams, which showed to be inferior to 5 milligram tablets, and also um, 10 and 20 milligrams were also uh, assessed as well, but they were not found to be superior, so that's how they ended up landing on the 5 milligram dose. 
mechanistically, these are working by increasing cyclic GMP, which, yeah, as we know, relaxes smooth muscle in the prostate, urethra, bladder, neck, pelvic blood vessels, and um, hopefully will improve the patient's overall symptoms. Um, based on studies and things, you know, we've seen that it does improve the uh, symptom index scores to some extent, um, you know, and, and we think of them as being about as efficacious as the uh, alpha blockers. Um, there's no um, or minimal increase in urinary flow rate or reduction in post void residual, um, you know, with Tadalafil alone. And so, you know, patients who you know, first getting started on monotherapy, I feel like in most cases they get put on the alpha blockers to start. And then this is kind of an afterthought as a, you know, augmentation option. Um, they can be potentially used first line in patients who have BPH and erectile dysfunction. Uh, but then you have to worry about cost and things as well because the Tadalafil 5 milligrams tends to be, for some insurance plans, a little bit more pricey than something like Tamsulosin. So it kind of depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, again, if the, what, what I look for personally is if a patient is on something like Tamsulosin and maybe they're on the Cialis 20 milligrams as needed, um, that would be somebody who, and, and obviously he's not having orthostasis or anything, that would be a patient that would probably want to switch from the as needed tam, uh, to Dalafil to the 5 milligram dose and just add it to their daily regimen to see if we can kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. And there are some common adverse effects, headache, flushing, gastric reflux, um, and back pain that is um, been linked to Tadalafil's to inhibition of uh, PDE type 11. And it usually responds to NSAIDs and Tylenol if you need to treat that. Chad GPT gave me that too. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Nice. I look up all my mechanism stuff with that. You know, they give a disclaimer to verify the information that he gives. Oh, I know. And I I'm have sure it's for a lot right? of that stuff. But, <laughs> I, you know, it, it also, I don't think anybody's going to get hurt if it's not phosphodiesterase <laughs> yes. type 11. That's correct. But in case you need to win trivia. <laughs> type 11. Type 11. <laughs> I didn't know there were 10 other types. I had no idea. Um, of course, these are contraindicated in anyone taking nitrates. And it appears that... Um, all of the PD5s seem to be comparable in terms of their improvement of symptoms based on a 2015 meta analysis, but Tadalafil is the only one who's actually that has actually been FDA approved for BPH. Yep. And so, uh, like we said earlier, if, you know, if we do use a combination of alpha blocker along with these, we need to make sure that we just really monitor the patient's blood pressure, stabilize them on one agent before moving on, and um, uroselective is is key. Yeah. Um, we also want to separate the Tadalafil from the alpha blocker by four hours or so if we can, and um, just to, again, mitigate some of that risk of the uh, orthostasis and all that. Yep. All right. So I guess let's jump into the overactive bladder side of things, and then we'll kind of merge them together after that. Does that work for you? Sure. So we'll start off with, uh, I think this is the first time we've done background information, talk through meds, then back to background information <laughs> or changing it up on you guys. But uh, when it comes to overactive bladder, um, one of the things we're trying to avoid, obviously, is urinary incontinence, which is the involuntary leakage of urine. Um, for, by definition, uh, overactive bladder is a symptom syndrome that's characterized either by urinary urgency. Um, you know, we typically think of that as like a, f a urinary frequency or nocturia, and it can also be associated with urinary, um, or excuse me, urgency urinary incontinence um, in the absence of a known pathologic condition. And obviously that can result in similar symptoms to things like a UTI, bladder cancer, and whatnot. So you, that's what they mean by it in the absence of a known pathological condition, um, but the symptoms can be kind of the same. Um, urinary urgency is, by definition, a, a compelling desire to urinate. Um, urinary uh, urgency, urinary incontinence is when that urge comes. The patient is unfortunately having leakage that's associated with that urgency, and um, obviously it can be problematic for a patient's, you know, social, again, social relationships and quality of life, you know, behavioral health and all that. Um Urinary frequency is, is defined as voiding eight or more times uh, during waking hours, and nocturia would be defined as two or more awakenings in the night, um, you know, to get up and urinate. There's also stress urinary incontinence or urethral underactivity, which would be brief bursts of um, urinary incontinence um, concomitant with exertional activities like exercise, running, coughing, sneezing, um, in this case, the muscular tissues around the urethra um, 
that form the urethral sphincter are uh, compromised. They're not able to resist the expulsive force um, resulting in periodic increases in intradominal, intraabdominal pressure during uh, these instances. And then that pressure is transmitted to the bladder, compressing it, causing the egress of urine through the urethra. So when we think of normal bladder emptying, um, you know, it's going to, when the, when the patient's trying to empty their bladder, we think of the decrease in urethral resistance that occurs. And then, you know, the, it's also going to decrease the contraction of the bladder, or excuse me, it's going to cause the contraction of the bladder muscle to expel the urine. During the, the, the filling process, the beta-3 androgenic um, receptors are stimulated, which relaxes the detrusor muscles. Alpha androgenic stimulation tightens the internal bladder sphincter, and um, then also muscularinic receptors are responsible for both emptying contractions of normal uh, micturition as well as involuntary bladder contractions that may um, result in urinary incontinence. And so if we are looking at those kind of three targets that you'll see that that's kind of where our medications tend to to go after and the beta-3 androgenic receptors i feel like are the the ones that at least me personally i'm the most excited about you know just from a side effect profile and you know all that so we'll get into that as a new class of or relatively new class of medications sure and there are behavioral therapies that are considered first line um, for oab symptoms bladder training which up to date has this amazing um, um document about kind of how to do that. I won't go into it too much now for time, but if you want to check it out, it's very interesting in terms of, um, uh, I don't know, basically training yourself to uh, prolong periods in between needing to uh, void. Um, delayed or scheduled voiding, um, and this can be helpful for patients with memory disorders like dementia. Pelvic floor muscle exercises, urge control techniques like distraction, fluid management, um, weight loss if you're... Um, uh, BMI is considered in the um, obese category. Uh, behavioral therapies can be combined with the meds um, to improve symptoms, and surgical intervention should be reserved for um, the rare non-neurogenic patients whose symptoms are intolerable. I picture uh, somebody doing like a you know, training montage, bladder <laughs> training, okay, right. Rocky music is play, playing yeah. in the background. Run to the top of the stairs and yeah. sneeze. Yeah, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm doing my bladder training. <laughs> Got John Wick playing in the background <laughs> for motivation. Da, 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 da. Uh, good movie. All right, so anticholinergics are kind of the longest standing treatment option that we've had for um, OAB. And basically we're using them for their anticholinergic properties. We want to induce urinary uh retention and, and kind of dry up, um, you know, secretions as we know the anticholinergic effects do. So the, I mean, the options, there's, there's so many with, with this class. I feel like this is one of the, you know, the most available options we have for a class of medications. But we have things like oxybutynin, um, which is an immediate release, extended release. There's also a topical gel. There's a patch version. Um, and then there's also um, some others like trospium. There's um, darafenacin, there's solafenacin, which would be uh, Vesicare, and then previously uh, Anablex. So there's there's definitely a few options, and the, the hard part with these, at least in my opinion, is the, they have very different, I shouldn't say very but different, but they have different uh, severities of their anticholinergic side effect profiles. And so depending on the patient's comorbidities and, you know, patient-specific factors, it may push you in one direction over the other when it comes to picking and choosing between these agents. Yeah. Um, there are some instances where you wouldn't want to use them, like gastric retention, decreased gastric mobility. Um, motility. The, um, sorry, motility. And then un 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 uncontrolled I air angle of glaucoma. Yeah, basically the same thing, right? Yeah. Not quite, but almost. Um, uh, they can cause issues, and they're, they have been linked to increased risk for dementia, um, which is concerning, but they can also cause agitation, confusion, especially in the elderly, dizziness and blurred vision. Um, other adverse effects like drowsiness, xerostomia, constipation. And then you do have to consider creatinine clearance um, if it's less than 30 with fesoteridine, solafenacin, tolteridine, and trospium. Um, you have to decrease the dose, and you can't use uh, trospium XR with the creatinine clearance that low. 
And then, you know, the, the oxybutynin, like I said, is, is a commonly used formulation and it does have um, one of those ghost shells for their extended release tablet. So kind of just be aware of that. Um, the, the patch and the gel can come into play whenever you're trying to avoid um, some of those anticholinergic side effects, especially the, the dry mouth and the constipation in particular tend to be significantly less with the, the patch and the gel. Um, and then the patch itself is um, placed on dry intact skin in the abdomen, hips, buttocks, and then you would want to, you know, alternate sites as you go. Uh, and then the gel is applied to the abdomen, thighs, upper arms, and same thing, you'd want to rotate application sites. Um, I mentioned uh, possible issues with memory disorders. So you do want to use caution in patients who are taking acetylcholinesterase inhibitors for dementia, like denepazil. Um, so just another reason to, to have these patients come off of these. Um, uh, the drugs will primarily stay in the periphery outside of the CNS, but some patients can experience CNS adverse effects like memory impairment. Um, so consider the, the risk and benefit. I'm sure um, in terms of quality of life, if they're working, then then it'd be difficult to come off of them, but um, they can definitely cause uh, memory issues. So I'll uh, let me switch to my, for those of you watching the video version, I'll switch to uh, my computer screen for a second. This is the DePiro's um, table that they use to kind of compare and contrast these agents and um, how they're, uh, what kind of uh, severity their anticholinergic uh, effects will produce. So oxybutynin, you can see like the dry mouth, um, you know, the, the dizziness tends to be a little high. And then, you know, some of them like the... Um, Trospium, for example, has really low visual disturbance. Um, same with the darafenacin. And so you basically are looking at something like this, you know, to kind of pick and choose between these agents, looking at it from a patient-specific standpoint. Obviously, there's going to be some agents that are better options for one patient over the other. And uh, this is just one way of kind of navigating that that selection process. Yeah. Um there's another class of medications, beta-3 agonists. Some of these drugs are relatively newer. Um, there's Merbetric, Mirabegron, which we've probably heard of. Um, it starts at 25 milligrams and can be increased up to 50 milligrams, and it relaxes the detrusor muscle and increases bladder capacity when it activates the beta-3 receptors. Um, it does have some renal dose adjustments um, as well as warnings related to angioedema um, and possible increases and urinary retention in patients with BPH um, and when used with anticholinergic drugs, though a 2020 meta-analysis showed that Merbetric was effective and safe um, if men with um, OAB are also taking Tamsulosin for BPH. Mm -hmm. It has some other adverse effects like hypertension, headache, constipation, so you do want to monitor blood pressure, heart rate, and other urinary symptoms. Um, and it does have drug interactions. It's a, it's a 2D6 inhibitor. Yeah, and the hypertension, is, from a statistical standpoint, tends to actually be a little bit higher risk in younger patients. Um, so that risk goes down a little bit as they get older. But I have seen some patients whose blood pressure skyrockets with Merbetric. So just be cautious with that. Um, if Merbetric is not something that you're wanting to go, you know, that a, a path you're not trying to go down because of the hypertension risk, um, well, good news. As of 2021, we have uh, Vibegaron or Gemtessa is the newest kid in the block that's in this class. And uh, it's just a 75 milligram dose given daily. doesn't require dose titration. Um, it was studied in a, a trial called the Empower trial, and it did not have an, any increase in adverse events lo uh, associated with hypertension compared to placebo. So that was one you know, big win for, for uh, Jim Tessa over Merbetric. And it also doesn't have any interactions with 2D6 uh, inhibitors. So that's also good news. Very good. Um, side effects, headache, nasopharyngitis, diarrhea, upper respiratory infection risk. Um, and, uh, you know, those are some of the more common effects. Um, really, I feel like this is pretty well tolerated. I've, I actually feel like we use quite a bit of this in our clinic. Um, you know, it's the beta-3 um, receptors are also found in the respiratory tract, and that can, can potentially influence the immune response in that area, which is why they think it can increase that risk of respiratory infections. I'm on a roll now of explaining why these weird side <laughs> effects happen. I don't know why I got on this kick lately. But I can't help it. Chat GPT um, must be yeah, uh, yeah. pretty active, huh? So active. <laughs> but, um, yeah, creatinine clearance less than 15. We're not going to use Jim Tessa. Did you want to talk about any of these um, studies before we talk about Botox? No. Um, in fact, you know, 
to, for time's sake, let's I guess we'll say that uh, you know Botox is is definitely an option for OAB. Um, you know, it's something that uh, you want to make sure that you're monitoring post void residual volume and uh, overall symptom improvement. But uh, it also can increase the risk of a UTI. Um, the urinary retention risk is a big deal. So if you have a patient with concomitant BPHs, it's probably not a good option for them. Um, and then for some patients, you know, the, the, uh, they'll get put on um, prophylactic antimicrobial therapy one to three days prior to uh, on the day of, and then obviously one to three days following Botox administration to cut down on that risk. So I presume they're injecting it into the bladder. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a cream. They just, I'm just kidding. No, it's, a, it's an injection. Man, I've got you twice. <laughs> I'm telling you what. I mean, I'm used to the migraine. Uh, oh, Botox, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which is similar to cosmetic. So this is one that's yeah. administered into a very different location. Yeah. It's quite different. Right, quite different. Seems much more uncomfortable. I wonder how many injections. Because with migraines, it's a whole bunch. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I've never seen the procedure done. Me either. But, uh, hmm. Yeah. Chat GPT, what you got? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, let's, I guess, bring it all back together now. Cause I feel like these, these is two disease states are kind of discussed as separate things. A lot of times we kind of focus on one or the other. Um, but you will have patients who, yeah, they are doing well on the Tamsulosin and, you know, the Tadalafil or the Finasteride or what have you. And in their BPH symptoms have improved. So they're, they're, you know, feelings of, uh, you know, still a, an, not an empty bladder, basically. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, having trouble with bladder with emptying. Post-void residual volume. Yeah, yeah, sure. There we go. That sounds better. Yeah. Okay. More post-void residual volume. <laughs> More um, residual volume. Yeah, there you go. But, uh, you know, the patient may have improvements there, but they're still having that urinary frequency, urgency, you know, with even, you know, incontinence as a possibility. And uh, it's one of those things that, you know, the you may need to address some of those symptoms. Obviously, we don't want to push it too far the other direction because we don't want to worsen the BPH symptoms again. So there has to be kind of a balance there. And um, I had a patient I saw just recently that had this exact kind of situation. And so um, basically the options at this point to fix some of those urinary urgency problems would be like an anticholinergic uh, or, you know, there are new potential options, the Merbetric or Gymtessa. With the anticholinergic op- options, I feel like that's just asking for trouble because of the balance there with the side effects. And you may get some of the side effects with the, the Merbetric or Gymtessa as far as the anticholinergic effects, but it's less likely. And especially in my anecdotal experience, I feel like it, they're much better tolerated. And so those would be, at least in my opinion, the, my first line like go-to add-ons if a patient has BPH and OAB symptoms that are, are still occurring. So the tamsulosin, the finasteride, dutasteride, the tadalafil is all helping with those side of, you know, the BPH side of the symptoms. And then the gymtessa or the merbetra can help with the urinary issues, yeah. the, the frequency and all that. So it tends to be a pretty decent combo. And, um, you know, the insurance coverage and all that. I feel like it's fairly decent on both of them because yeah. they, are, they are pricey. But that would be my go-to options uh, before having to mess with an anticholinergic. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Is that, is that a good enough explanation to make sense of all that? I think you brought it back in perfectly. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> I was really trying hard there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so definitely one of those things that uh, – I need to be, especially in male patients who have BPH, needs to be looked at as separate things, but also, you know, how they interact with each other because they do have that interplay. Yes. The most important note, I think, is is a lot of times when we think BPH, we think men. Mm-hmm. We think overactive bladder. We think women. Mm-hmm. But men also yes. have overactive bladder. Yes. That can that can look like BPH. Mm-hmm. Maybe be misdiagnosed for, you know, if it uh, on a on a cursory glance or, or the same kind of thing is, you know, the patient just, or they, they're, someone's looking through their charts like, Oh, well they have BPH of course. And just associating the urinary urgency and incontinence right. symptoms with BPH, which the is not necessarily the case. Thinking BPH, right. When you yeah. think LUTs, but it's not necessarily. Yes. Yeah. So yes. definitely good to have uh, both those things in your mind for your male patients, especially. Yep. So like we said earlier, make sure if you are a free CE member, Go get your credit, um, ace the 10 question, multiple choice test, quiz, whatever you want to call it. And then uh, you'll have one hour continuing education credit. And um, I hope that uh, has been helpful for everyone. And um, we've very much appreciated Free CE continuing to partner with us. And uh, they've been fantastic to work with. So definitely encourage you to check out their library of content if you have not done so already. 
Also, um, make sure you check out Pearls. Um, it's a drug info app that we've talked about many times. They've been um, partnered with us for quite a while. And uh, if you go to Pearls, P-Y-R-L-S dot com slash core consult Rx, um, you can download uh, the, the free version of the, the, the app. And you can also get some free PDF uh, downloadable like algorithms for treatment of various disease states and things. It's some really good content. So very uh, cool um, app and, and growing pretty significantly as far as the amount of content that's on there. Um, from where they started to where they are now, it's very impressive. So thanks to Pearls for continuing to work with us. And then also um, the uh, High Powered Medicine second edition is available. Um, we heard from uh, Alex Poppin last week or two weeks ago now, I said, I guess. And um, he's the, the author of this book is a great um, review of over 150 landmark trials. So definitely very convenient for a quick reference. And if you are a member of the Patreon, which has our uh, more lecture, traditional lecture style content on there with PowerPoint slides and all that boring stuff, um, you if you if you are a Patreon who subscribes for the annual membership, you will get a free digital copy of High Powered Medicine, um, the evidence based medicine book and review of landmark clinical trials. So, just more incentive to check out the Patreon. Oh yeah. And um, if you guys have any questions for Cole and myself, make sure you send us an email, um, message us on, on any of the social media platforms. The you can text the phone number. I will say um, I did not realize I had a error in my uh, the, the app that I used for that number and uh, that's in the show notes and I did not realize my phone was not getting or sending um, text when I would use that oh, that right. number so I got all of a sudden I fixed the problem and I got a, a huge uh, influx of text messages that I have not been answering to people who are listening so if that applies to you, very sorry about that. We're not intentional. Uh, apparently, I'm just not very good with technology or, or updating apps. So I'm sorry about that, but I'll def- I'm going to work on that over the next couple of days to get back to everybody, you know, a month later. <laughs> but uh, thank you guys so much for listening, and uh, we'll see you all on the next episode. Have a good one.